it's, uh, it's a great time today. And you know what's so interesting is that all of the speakers are effectively building on each other's comments. And I want you to know that wasn't planned, but it, it represents something that I think is really important for us to understand. And that is these ideas are likely, if so many of us are coming to them, there's probably something to hold on to here. So with that said, I'm gonna transform and hopefully you'll learn something from what I have to say. So when I grew up, I felt like an outsider. I looked different, I felt different, I acted different from all those other kids in my class. So why was that? Well, in part, it was because I'm first generation American. Uh, my both, my parents were immigrants from Germany and I'm the first one in my family to be born in this country. Given my wardrobe, that's my sister and I, it was no surprise that I looked different. English kilts, embroidered dresses, little pocketbooks. Um, those were the staples in my closet. Go-go boots and mini skirts and that hairdo, um, they were not on the back to school shopping list. Now, being different as a kid was really, really hard. It really bothered me. And I remember vividly uh, coming home crying, lying on my bed in the afternoon, closing the door so my mother didn't see me and crying. I really wanted to be like the other kids. I wanted to be invited to the same parties. I wanted to dress the way they did. It was not a good scene. But then in middle school, something happened. I learned that being different, standing out from the crowd, actually was a pretty good thing. So from making a movie on environmental pollution in eighth grade to, yes, sponsoring Camp Aging Insurrection in 2016, the pain of not fitting in became the joy of being different. Now, I'm a boomer, like Bob. Fonz is really not a boomer. I think he's one year beyond being a boomer. But I am a boomer and never shy to divulge my age. I was born in 1956, making me 65. I am smack in the middle of this crazy cohort. Now, Bob talked yesterday about people like me being 12 to 15 years out in terms of buying. And that's probably true for me, but remember, boomers like me are buyers. We're buying for our parents today. As uh, Scott Stewart said yesterday, 10,000 of us turn 65 each day. And the oldest among us are turning 75. And what does that mean? It means that some of us are losing our spouses or partners, many of us, understand that growing old is not always so golden, and that we have ailments, and that we find ourselves talking to each other about the number of meds we take every day. I never thought I'd be there. But I will tell you what that means is that many of us, whether we say it or not, are beginning to think about our options. But regardless of where you fall in this crazy cohort, if you are a boomer, Boomers, and for those of you who are not, you still need to understand that we have some things in common. We cherish our individuality. We seek a life that's true to ourselves. And we expect others to deliver on what we want, on our unique needs and desires. So who knows, maybe I'm not that different anyway, maybe I'm just one of 76.4 million boomers living in America today. It's a lot of people. The next generation of consumer is going to want to live where they want to live, do what they want to do, and be with whom they want to be. They're going to expect us in senior living to magically intuit what they want and then deliver on it. Ultimately, boomers, while well, we're seeking a longer health and lifespan, we want greater self-actualization, you know, the peak of Maslow's hierarchy. And yes, we want a perfect score 
on the happiness scale. And I thought it was great what we saw yesterday in Ryan's uh, presentation, where we tend to be on the higher end anyway, but like many people, we all want perfection. So you might laugh at this or think, you know, okay, I've heard this before. But underneath all this, this picture really does represent a boomer's dream that we have to make a daytime reality. How many of you know Eric Topol? Okay, I got one. Thank you, Bob. So three to four years ago, um, Dr. Topol wrote an article. And the article was on personalized medicine. And uh, one of the things that I've learned since, it, the, the article fascinated me, totally fascinated me. And what I've learned since is that personalized medicine is gaining traction, not only with doctors, but also among patients who want to live healthier lives. So what is personalized medicine? It's an emerging practice that uses individual genetic profiles to diagnose and treat disease in order to foster the outcomes we want. Now, genomics is the name for work related to the collection and use of our DNA. Dr. Topol says that genomics is probably the biggest health-related breakthrough in the last 50 years. Using our DNA, the study of genomics is the biggest health-related breakthrough in the last 50 years. I don't know if you'll agree after we get finished, but it's a major change in how we look at things. So how does genomics move us from traditional to personalized medicine? So our DNA, what is our DNA? Our DNA offers us a detailed, individualized blueprint of our body. DNA patterns show individual susceptibility or resistance to disease. Personalized medicine adds genetic data to health data in order to understand how to be aware of disease before it happens, to target it before it occurs. And if you can't avoid it, it helps us treat the disease differently for us as individuals in order to get a best outcome for you. So what's a good example of this? Uh, women in the room, has anyone been screened for the BRCA gene? OK, I got a couple. All right, so that's personalized medicine or a good example. If you are BRCA positive, BRCA positive, and it helps if you also have a history of breast cancer in your family, you can choose to proactively have breast tissue removed where cancer might otherwise form. That's what personalized medicine is about. It's about understanding not just your health and your environment, but your DNA. So, you know, I'm bothered. I'm bothered by a lot of things, I think you know that, but medicine, why are we always talking about medicine? Why do we always talk about curing disease? Why don't we, why are we looking for new cures? You know, curing people is expensive. It's really expensive. And I don't know about you, but it's not what I want. I don't want to get sick in the first place. I want to stay healthy. So why not be proactive and focus on preventing disease in the first place? You know, Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Sounds silly, but I agree with him. Consider these humbling statistics. Now, how many of you know that chronic disease is the number one killer in the US today? Anybody aware of that? 70%, seven of 10, deaths in the US are attributed to chronic illness. Talk about a shift, right? And 50% of the people in our country, and this is all the people in our country, just not older adults, have at least one chronic disease. Something like heart disease or diabetes, both of which, I'll have you know, are classified as preventive. 
There's a, a researcher at UNC Chapel Hill, a guy by the name of Michael Pignoni, and he's calculated, he's looked at this, and he's calculated that chronic illness costs $1.5 trillion every year in America. And he says, no surprise to us, that focusing on prevention on older adults, older high-risk adults, will offer savings if we can prevent acute episodes that cost the most money. Pignoni's research suggests that prevention can save $45 billion every year. These statistics, to me, the fact that chronic disease is the number one killer, that many chronic diseases are preventable, it suggests that our national policy agenda needs to shift. We need to put greater emphasis on proven prevention. So my friends, it's time for another mindset shift. You know, the Affordable Care Act disrupted the medical paradigm. We went from paying for things on an episodic basis to value-based care. This is another fundamental shift. We need to move from intervention to prevention. We need to be proactive, not reactive. We need to focus on health and well-being, not so much on medicine. You know, in short, we're really not talking about the personalized medicine that Dr. Topol wrote about. We're talking about personalized health. So what does that mean for the next generation of senior living? It means, it means that we must deliver a personalized life experience. We need to deliver on personalized health. Now, how do we do that? Well, personalized health, just like personalized medicine, is going to be driven by data. But in addition, it's going to be propelled by experiential, engaging programming. These things, this high-tech, high-touch approach, needs to work together. What will it yield? Whole person engagement, vitality, and health. Now, how do we get from here to there? You know, where our goal is to make sure that boomers like me, and Bob, I'm going to count you in on this one, well, that we really want to flock to our communities. You know, Steve Moran has often asked, would you live in your own community? And I have damn good communities. But right now, that community is not offering the kind of life I want to live. So my answer would be no. I see it as my job, as our job, to figure out how to get boomers, like me, like Bob, like many others here, I think, Steve, you're one of us as well, um, to flock to our communities. As Bob said, to come, to want to be there, not to want to run away. So in order to do that, they have to focus on two things. The first is data and technology. And the second is experiential, engaging programming. And again, these things need to work together. So let's drill down a bit. You like this? If only it was my big idea. Um, data and technology has to give us, it will give us the data, the understanding we need to, to allow others to help us make the best choices for living a good life a life of personalized health and well-being. I'm going to call that thing, that set of options, using that data, I'm going to call that from now on a lifestyle prescription. A lifestyle prescription. So that's the information you need to chart a course to your best health, to personalized health and well-being. And with that lifestyle prescription, we in senior housing can formulate a lifestyle plan. The plan, in turn, will help us develop the environment and the programming that will help us meet people's individual goals, individual goals for well-being. So unlike personalized medicine, I believe we need three types of data. We need traditional health data. We need behavioral data. 
and lifestyle preferences, sometimes always known as social determinants of health-related data, and we need genetic data. And we're going to have to synthesize that data, not consider it in silos or in individual pieces, but bring it together and synthesize it to paint an individualized picture of our residents who going forward, if I'm using the terms lifestyle, prescription, and plan, I'm also going to call our residents members. I'm going to shift the language. I don't know that that's ultimately the right word, but residents I know are not, because we're going to want to bring other people in to our orbit. So before I go on, I need to and talk more about technology. I want to remind us, as Eric Topol did, that technology should enhance humanity. It should allow us to expand the human bond not reduce it. And Eric Tobel has written a recent book, and in it he says, look, technology is a good thing. I'm a big believer in technology and in using more of it. But medical practitioners need to use technology with one thing in mind, to free up time to spend with their patients. Not to use the technology as an end in itself, but to free up time to create a human bond. Um, our goal is a strong balance between high tech and high touch. And what does tech provide us? Well, it gives us quick answers, or quicker answers, and it gives us greater efficiency. It gives us more time and energy for us to be with people. Because why? Being with others enriches, enlivens, and engages us. It's what creates community. After COVID, and I know we're not 100% there, but I don't know about you, I'm feeling like hopefully we're on the tail end. How do we get this done? We talked about the, the dream that boomers wanted to make a daytime reality. Well, is this a dream, this technology play? Or is this a daytime reality? I believe we need to adopt new technology. And I know that many of you are sitting there saying, oh my God, you know, Another thing, and it has a price tag, right? What am I gonna do? It's difficult, it's daunting. I can't manage to get my people to do these things. But frankly, we're going to have to. Why? Because, I don't know about you, but are you, well, let me ask, are you using more technology post-COVID? How many of you spend the day in front of a computer looking at Zoom, having Zoom meetings? Is there anyone who's not? Let's try the outliers. OK. You know, and I don't know about you, but I have become really good at shopping. Shopping online. It doesn't always fit. It doesn't always look good, but I can send it back. And you know what? I'm starting to socialize online. And it's not my favorite way to do it, but let me give you an example of one of the things that happened in my family. Um, you know, I'm a kid of immigrants, and during the Holocaust, people were sent all over, the children were sent all over the world. And several of my aunts and uncles um, actually got out of Germany on the last children's transport. And they ended up not living in America, some of them. Some of them are in England, they're all over the place. Anyway, to make a long story short, during COVID, one of my uncles, who's in his 90s, said, I want to see people. I want to get together with people. And so all of a sudden, we began these Zoom family meetings. You know, reunions used to happen once every three, four years. And I don't know about you, but I wasn't going to be the one to organize that. Um, and so we all got together. And now we do it once a month. So our way of socializing has changed, and technology has made that possible. But I want to tell you that there's some, also some good news out there. Tech is evolving rapidly. And while some of you might think, ah, that's a bit of a problem, I'm going to suggest it's an advantage. It's actually going to be a solution. The next generation of technology is going to be more robust. But importantly for us, it's going to require us to do less. We're going to get more and do less. Isn't that amazing? Something that actually works that way. Now, at this conference a couple of years ago, I think it was in Napa, and Michael, you're going to, I'm sure, call me out on this, but um, 
there was someone who stood up who talked about ambient sensors. And I was so taken with this thought. At the time, you know, a lot of the presentations were on wearables and how we were going to use wearables to collect data. And this guy got up and he said, forget the wearables. We're going to collect data by walking in a room. You know, what's an example? Well, it's lighting that's embedded with sensors. And what does that do? That tracks your movement in the home. And then what happens? Well, when you get in the room, the lights go on. That's pretty prevalent. You can get that now, but you just take that image and roll it forward. There's a lot more like that. So now I want to introduce you to a new term. It's called ambient computing. Not ambient sensors, ambient computing. It's a broad term. It describes the next generation of devices that will collect data and more. It actually describes the, the environment of smart devices, of data, of artificial intelligence, and tracking of human activity. Why? What will it do? Well, computers or digital devices are going to be working alongside us as part of our everyday life. And they're going to be doing it without human command or intervention. And while I know a lot of you are probably saying, oh my privacy, I'm scared of all this garbage. Um, for me, how many of you carry a smartphone? Okay, is there anyone who does not have a smartphone in this room? Try that again. I don't see a single hand, thank goodness. So you're being tracked. Everything you do is being tracked. So for me, the notion of ambient sensors or ambient computing, while it sounds kind of out there, it's already happening. We're just not aware of it. So let's harness it. Let's use it for our own good. So the first step in providing this personalized lifestyle prescription is to collect the new data. How do we do that? Well, health data, many of us use. We're a PCC user and have been for the last 10 years. We have a large data set on our residents' health and, and well-being, things like vitals, meds, et cetera. Most of you have that kind of data, and hopefully most of you have it in a digital form. The second kind of data is behavioral data. And this, too, I would argue you have. Most of you know if your residents smoke, if they sleep, how they sleep, their sleep patterns. You know what they do to keep fit, and you have a pretty good idea of what they eat. Most of you, like Juniper, have a social profile. At Juniper, we call it My Life Story. And one of the things I really like about it is that it asks questions about what you liked to do in the past, what, your, what you did earlier in your life, what you like to do now, and as Bob suggested, what you want to do in the future. Last step is genetic data, and let me tell you how Juniper is capturing this data, and I, if you choose to, I can share with you a very simple way for you to do it, and that is um, through COVID-19 testing. We learned, do you know, how many of you are sequencing your test results, your positive test results? You know, when they go and they take your swab, if you're positive, they sequence it in this machine, the cost of those machines have come down. Guess what? Those machines not only sequence the Delta variant, they also sequence DNA. So if you get permission from people, you can actually have access to their genetic profile. But that's not all you need to do. Then you need to normalize and combine the data in a data pool, and you have to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually produce this lifestyle prescription. Good news, that technology is there. It's there already. And I believe in the next 24 to 36 months, we'll be able to harness that technology and these data to produce a lifestyle prescription. Let's talk about uh, innovation and service delivery. We are talking about integrating communities with health and community partners. Some of us may actually name what we are going to call a lifestyle coach or concierge to help members engage. But most of all, what I want you to take away from this is a fundamental shift in thinking, another one, sorry. We need to move from doing for people to doing with people. 
We need to move from doing for to doing with. And we need environments that create an integrated programming, an integrated environment and programming rather than segregated. And that's what we have today. You know, we've got great programs. We do everything from obviously the bingo stuff to book groups to, you know, church, all of that. But we need to do it differently. Now, Mather Institute has been around since 1941. I hope many of you know them. They are probably the, uh, the most renowned group that studies wellness and well-being in senior living. Um, recently, they recognized that their future consumer wants wellness, but they want it to reflect that they are different from the next guy. So they're developing a new model, and they released it last week. It's called the Person-Centric Wellness Model. It's designed to empower individuals to choose the type of uh, fulfillment that matches their aspirations. And yesterday, Bob talked a lot about aspirational living. So what does the next generation of senior living look like? It looks like Bob giving a talk and me being dunked. What's wrong with this picture? Um, it's a place where boomers like me choose to live. It's a place where public spaces are part of the community at large, where people of all ages come together, whether it's to worship, for book groups, to learn how to samba, or to have a drink at 5 o'clock or 4 o'clock, if that's better for you. It's a place where an environment optimizes our ability to make our own choices about our life, where we're set up for success and achievement in this stage of life, and where people know you and encourage you. Mather says that three things contribute to success. There are three drivers of success, and I agree, autonomy, achievement, and affiliation. And their recent studies, they have something uh, which is a longitudinal study called the AgeWell study, has shown that when these drivers are in full gear, physical and emotional well wellness is actually enhanced. So what does it take for this dream to be an everyday reality? It takes a personalized lifestyle prescription. A lifestyle prescription that's powered by a new data set that synthesizes real-time health data, lifestyle data, and genetics. It takes a lifestyle plan which is activated by programming that encourages autonomy, achievement, and affiliation. Because our goal, a boomer's goal, our consumer's goal, our member's goal, is a life which is defined by personalized health, engagement, and vitality. That's the life that boomers want. So will you join me on this high-tech, high-touch pathway where technology and data are finally accepted as foundational operating tools, where programming is not done for people, but with people, where the environment is not segregated but integrated with the community at large. I hope so, because as a boomer, I'm counting on you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn.